as Keith and I were sharing about what I was led to bring as a message today, he went to that song and shared it, and I hope you listen to the words. You bow with me as we pray. Father, this is a special time on your day when we praise and worship you. It's a special time when we open your word and together share from it and learn from it. To do that, our hearts must be open, our ears must be attentive, we must be submissive to your spirit. And I pray that we are, and I pray that what is shared here today would reflect your heart and it would bring you glory. And I pray that in your son's name. Amen. One of those phrases that you sometimes hear is, thank goodness it's Friday. You know, the end of the work week comes for many, and the, sun, the weekend is coming, and everybody's getting excited and prepared for that. And, and it's like Friday is just this day of being happy. In fact, Friday has almost become synonymous with happiness and being carefree. So much so that it's even invaded the pulpits of some of our churches. Well, let me share with you a spiritual and practical truth today. There will never be a life that is filled with nothing but happiness. There will never be a life that is absent of suffering. And contrary to what they say, every day will never be a Friday. And I want to share with you today about something very, very important in our spiritual lives and, and our daily lives. We're going to share today that suffering, that which we go through and that which we see, comes from God's judgment on sin and his response to the sin of his creation. And I want us to understand this, that we serve a sovereign God who calls us to worship him through our suffering, in our suffering. For the last nine months, we've shared about living the cross and the implications of the cross in our lives, the cross in community, the cross in marriage, the cross in your pastor, even how to share the cross with a child. But we would not be fully addressing the necessity of living the cross if we avoided the issue of suffering. And underlying our message today is one verse. Now, we're going to look at a lot of verses, but there's one verse that I want us to share at the beginning, which is our foundational verse today. And if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 4. 1 Peter, in chapter 4, we're going to share verse 19. The New King James Version says this, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. The English Standard Version says this, Therefore let, us, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now the reality is that God's sovereignty and even suffering is far too expansive a subject to address in one sermon. We're going to share some of it today, and next Sunday I'm going to continue as we talk about how we walk through suffering. But as I begin this message, I want to confess with you that I've struggled with this message as much or perhaps more than I've ever struggled with a sermon. And it wasn't with accepting the spiritual principles or the truth of the Word. But it was trying to come to grips with the compatibility of God's sovereignty, his absolute control, and the suffering that we experience and that is evident in our world. And my struggle with understanding has led me to an understanding that I will never understand it all. But that's not a call to avoid it or to dismiss it. Instead, it's a call to seek to understand the nature of God and how in his sovereignty, he calls us to display him, even in the midst of some very difficult times. And so in our journey of understanding, we're going to begin with the origin of suffering. Now, the words that all of us are familiar with that begin the Bible itself say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is a statement that encompasses 
his creation, it encompasses his power, it encompasses his ownership, all of those things. And as you follow that verse throughout, we see God acting and creating the water and the lands, and he creates the animals and the birds and the fish, and then eventually he creates man and woman. And he says to, to Adam and Eve, he says, okay, this is my creation. You have dominion over it, and, and you can enjoy it and live in it. But listen, he says, there's one thing you can't do. And he tells him you can't eat of this tree. That's it. Now, why did he do that? Well, he gave to them a standard for obedience and faithfulness. Their righteousness would be measured by how they responded to him saying to them, do not do this, commanding them. Well, we know that they disobeyed and they ate what they were told not to eat. And in that moment, sin entered humanity and it tainted all the humanity that would follow. And when we look at how God responded to that disobedience and rebellion, we see that part of his nature that we refer to as just. His justice comes from his justness. And, and if you say, well, what, what does it really mean to be just? Well, it basically means to be right. In God's circumstances, what is right is determined solely by him. There is no exterior or outside standard. He alone, in his nature, determines what is right. And when that is violated, he determines his response. And we see that taking place in Genesis. Now, if you want to follow, it's in Genesis 3. And it tells us very specifically what happened because Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Beginning in verse 16 of Genesis 3, we read this. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. To Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. And cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and it shall, you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And then as it continues, if you look down at verse 22, we're told this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever... Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. When we read this, we see that Adam and Eve's disobedience brought about God's judgment. And suffering became just a natural byproduct of disobedience in that experience. And God exercised his justness and he imposed suffering on Adam and Eve and necessarily on humanity that followed. And so it's important for us to, to see and to understand that God's the origin of suffering. Now sin is what brought it about, but it came about because God imposed his judgment for sin. And in our rebellion, we have been separated from God, and now it extends to our hearts and our lives and our relationships and our emotions and all of those other things. And therefore, suffering is the result of sin. But listen carefully. It doesn't mean that our suffering is a result necessarily of a particular sin. And we see that in Scripture, and we see it vividly in John 9. In John 9, Jesus is confronted by a blind man, and he heals him. And his disciples look to him and they say, okay, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because they believe there had to be a particular sin that brought about his suffering. Jesus answered in verse 3 and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Listen to that. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. It's not a particular sin. But more importantly, God says his blindness is there so that God's purpose can be shown through it. 
And we, don't, we can't miss this lesson. You see, contrary to popular belief, not everyone suffers because they deserve it. And sometimes what comes around does so before it goes around. Recall our focal verse for today. Here's what it said. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. If you look at the Greek word for commit there, it's the same word that would be used to place something on deposit as with a banker for safety. And God says, you commit your souls to me because I'm your creator. I'm the one who made you and everything else. And so you place yourself keeping in me and only in me. And an important point as we share this morning is that we have to make sure that we never separate a sovereign God from the sufferings that we experience. We ask ourselves, if that's the case, what are we supposed to do? I mean, how do we respond to the suffering that all of us have experienced, may be experiencing now, or we're going to experience? You know, looking around our world today, we see those who are suffering. And in many instances, we see the godly who are suffering, and we see the ungodly who are suffering. But the Bible destroys the notion that suffering is limited to the worst of humanity. In Matthew 5, 45, here's what Jesus said. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And the Bible bears that out. David suffered because of his particular sin. Job suffered because of his faithfulness. Radically different situations, but in both you see the existence of suffering. And our goodness, even the faithfulness of Job and our faithfulness does not insulate us from suffering. And suffering and death are natural consequences of the just judgment of God on sin in general. And it's very important to how we view suffering and how we journey through it. Because you see today, sadly, there's a whole bunch of folks in our world who think that God deserves us a good life. That is, we deserve to have the very best. No suffering, no problems, no unhappiness, no sorrow, nothing. That's the God that we want and to many the God that they think they have. And instead of this vertical relationship that goes from us to him. We now have this relationship in which we view God as a benefactor who responds to our wants and keeps everything which we might consider to be suffering and harmful away from us. But if you read the book of Job, you can really learn some stuff, and we can learn some stuff about suffering. We don't have time for that today, but it's really interesting when you get to the end of, of Job, and, and Job questions God. And, and wants to know this. And God says, well, let's just put this into context, Job. And he begins to compare Job's humanity with his divine nature. And here's what he says. Where were you when I made the mountain or the seas? He says, hey, Job, can you wrap up all the stars? Can you make clouds and rain and lightning? Can you command the hawk and eagle to fly? Are you strong as a horse? And obviously the answer is, no, but he was teaching Job that a lesson on suffering is to accept our unworthiness and that God is far beyond our, hu our humanity. And that leads us to surrender to his sovereignty. And then importantly and secondly, as we read the New Testament, we see a God who's come to human flesh and has experienced not only what we experience, but more than most of us will ever experience. He knows firsthand, not from way off, what you and I walk through every single day. He knows of hunger, poverty, disappointment, and despair. And Scripture makes sure that we understand that. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And it carries the lesson and the message in there. We can trust a sovereign God who has experienced and walked through exactly what you and I go through. Now listen carefully. After a lot of prayer and reading and study and struggle, I can't tell you why a sovereign God allows evil and suffering to continue. 
can't tell you why the godly and ungodly don't suffer, and I can't tell you why the godly and the ungodly do suffer. But I can tell you this, that God loves us so much that he took on human form in his son Jesus Christ so that he could feel and taste and touch and hear everything that you and I go through. What else could he have done to create in us complete trust in his wisdom? If God did not withhold the most precious thing in all of eternity, his son Jesus Christ, and, pay attention, and he didn't withhold himself because of his love for us, why would he not have a purpose in our suffering? And it leads us to understanding how and why we endure suffering. Now we're going to explore this more next week. But understand this. There's no cookie cutter pattern that you put out there for experience and individuals that says this is how you deal with it. We have foundational principles. But every single one of us in here have different personalities, different backgrounds, different emotional responses. But common among every single believer should be an understanding that God has a purpose in our suffering and it will display him to the world if we employ it. As hard as it may be for us to understand, God is both completely in control of his creation and he exercises that control in a way that allows us to choose our actions and be responsible for our actions. Ephesians 1.11 says this, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works in all things according to the counsel of his will. We see that in a lot of different places, and we see it vividly in the story of Joseph. In Genesis, we're told about Joseph, and and most of us probably know, most of you probably know that story, but, but Joseph is eventually kidnapped by his brothers, and he's sold into slavery. I mean, imagine that, your own family who takes you and puts you in a hole and then eventually sells you and just get out of here. But Joseph rises through the court of Pharaoh after he's taken there, and eventually he sees his brothers again, and he bears out God's sovereignty in suffering in Genesis 50, 20. Here's what he says. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. See, Joseph's suffering had a greater purpose than the moment. God had a purpose in what took place in his life. And we can take comfort in knowing that evil and ungodliness, which are not part of God's original design, are still used by him. We see it in Scripture. We see it in life. We can also take comfort in knowing that the story we read in Genesis is told again in the New Testament in one verse that we quote and claim and hopefully live. It's Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. That's the story of Joseph and the story of a believer's life. That God takes the experience and the suffering and through that brings glory to himself. And we need look no farther than his son to see that. He was betrayed by a disciple. He was abandoned by his followers. He was tried by those who were standing there looking for a Messiah and didn't see him. He was rejected by those who only a few days before had clapped and applauded his coming. And ultimately, he was forsaken by his father when on the cross. And we have to understand that God is not only a sovereign God, but he's also a suffering God. You see, he endured all of that out of love for his creation. We cannot and we must not segregate, separate, divorce the sovereignty of God from the suffering of God. It serves as the supreme example of his love and the supreme example for us to follow. And I've never found a better human quote than by a fellow named Dan McCartney. Here's what he said. Christ learned humanhood from his suffering. 
And therefore, we learn Christhood from our suffering. Now, that's borne out repeatedly in Scripture. Let me just share those with you. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 5 through 7. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. And when Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, what we know is Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And when you go to our focal verse and read a little bit more of that passage in 1 Peter 4 and you begin reading in verse 13, it says this, Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Are we mindful of the suffering of Christ, and he was sinless, but he did it for our sin. He did it knowing that it was part of God's plan and for his glory, and we have to do also. And, and that's so clearly shown if the night before Jesus' crucifixion, the night before he was going to be taunted and scorned by so many, he was going to be beaten and tortured. He was going to be forced to carry his own means of execution. He was going to hang on a cross rejected. In one moment, a perfect, sinless, eternal being would take on the sins of all of humanity. In preparation for that, he went and prayed. And listen to what he prayed. First thing he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus said this, Father, in my suffering... May you be glorified. That should be our prayer. In whatever we experience, that which is uninvited, unwelcome, but that through which God works. I want to end with what may sound at first like an oxymoron. And I call it the good of suffering. And to do that, I want to share a story with you. And a portion of it you probably know. And it's the story of a lady named Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth was born on December the 21st, 1926, and she passed away on June the 15th of this year. She was born to missionary parents who were missionaries in Belgium. And this is a picture of Elizabeth. Elizabeth went to Wheaton College, and there she studied uh, classical Greek because she felt God's call on her life to translate the Bible into languages for remote tribes. And so while at Wheaton, she met her future husband, Jim. And later, Jim and Elizabeth went to Ecuador. And when they got there, they began ministering to the Quichua tribe. And they began, and Elizabeth began, translating as best she could the Bible into a written language for them. While they were there, they became aware of the Aka tribe. And the Aka tribe were incredibly fierce people. In fact, no non-member of their tribe had ever gone there and not been killed. So Jim and four missionaries went to the Aka tribe, and there they met three members of the tribe. And soon thereafter, Jim and the other four missionaries 
were killed. Down the road, a ways in time, Elizabeth met two Aka women. And as a result of that, became friends with them, and Elizabeth actually went to the Aka tribe and ministered there for two years. Now, you may know that story from the book and movie entitled The End of the Spear. But there's more to the story. Because you see, in 1966, Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book entitled No Graven Image. And in this book, the main character is an unmarried woman named Margaret uh, Sparhawk. And Margaret is translating and wants to translate the Bible from spoken language to written language. And so she goes to the Kishwa tribe, and she begins going through this and working. And in the course of that, she meets a man named Pedro. And Pedro begins to assist her because he knows the unwritten language, and he begins to help her in translating the Bible to written form. One day, Margaret journeys to Pedro's home, which is far away. And when she gets there, Pedro has a severe leg infection And so, because of the remoteness, Margaret often had medicine with her, so she got out penicillin and she gave Pedro a shot. And Pedro had a severe allergic reaction to that penicillin, and he went into shock. And his wife, Rosa, is standing there, and she's crying uncontrollably, and she's accusing Margaret of killing her husband. And in the midst of that, Margaret falls to her knees, and she begins to pray fervently. And she says, Lord God, Father of us all, if you've never heard me pray, hear me now. Save him, Lord. Save him. And she cries out that Pedro is the key to completing the work. But Pedro dies. And as Margaret leaves, she asks herself, how can I worship a God who lets this happen? But you see, Elizabeth Elliot, the author of that novel, explains the end. She said in her words, she said, God, if he was merely my accomplice, has, accomplice, has betrayed me. If, on the other hand, it was God, he had freed me. You see, the title of that book, No Gra- Graven Image, reveals that sometimes we create a graven image. And it is a God who always acts the way we think he should. A God who supports our plans, who hears our requests and grants them across the board. But you see, that God that we create is a counterfeit God. He becomes our accomplice in seeing and having the world as we want it. And in Pedro's death, the God that Margaret had created was no more, and now she was free to worship the true God. No more did she have the God of my plans. He was now replaced with the real God. And she now saw that her suffering led her to God, and she no longer lived a life trying to control all of her life. And friends, for too long, people have created their own version of God. A God who blesses, but he doesn't punish. A God who comforts, but he never chastises. And listen up. Many create a God who is totally removed from suffering. That is not the God of the Bible. So how do we walk through it? Well, we're going to continue to share about that. But as we end today, God's given us his word about suffering and what we should do. If your Bible's still open, I share one last passage, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is a passage that you will sometimes hear spoken at the graveside of a funeral or in funeral services. It has application to every moment of life. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
Beloved, the suffering of our life is temporary. It is not eternal. But the suffering of our life should always be an opportunity to display God and bring Him glory. Because the sovereign God that we love and worship does not remove Himself from our suffering. But we also see one other lesson in these verses. God says that the things which are not seen are eternal. That's the essence of faith. Faith is claiming, holding, being convicted of that which we can't see or hear or feel or touch or smell, but we are absolutely convinced it's true. And that faith that we look to in our suffering is the faith that begins our walk with God. The most important lesson that we ever get from this is that there's a God who loves so much that he gave an only son that so through faith we could look forward to that which is eternal and glorify him in this which is temporary. Wherever you are today, perhaps it's spoken to us in suffering, perhaps it's prepared us for suffering, perhaps it's allowed us to look back at suffering in a different light. But maybe today for somebody... It's an awareness that this God loves you so very much. And he wants nothing, nothing more than for you to become his child. Let me pray with you before our invitation.